representation. So, so we don't have about things which are sort of solids, liquids, but not gases of another type. So, we not be seeds or anything like that. Even though they have some features which, in some cases, are similar. I'm going to talk about essentially orbitals. So, I'm going to talk about what you might call an orbital solid and what you might also call an orbital liquid, and also perhaps a quantum critical point that you can actually have as well. And basically, it is what I'm trying to motivate are relations between orbitals and spin. So basically, many ideas that you have, the results that you know about, is spin orders and so on, and various types of intergalactic orders and phases <coughs> and very phases, and all that can actually raise its head again in orbital physics. So this is what was done over quite a few years with quite a few people. And we also have alphabetical orders, so Christian Batista, Mark Biscuit, and Biscuit Shays, Ruben and Brinkman and Dresden now, Gladys Lapkin, Kavarjan and Tees, and this more recently is graduate student, Daniel Kalinera. Okay, so before I run out of time, <laughs> let me tell the conclusions are. So basically, one of the conclusions is that for, for a long time it was believed that in order to have orbital order, you need to, which is actually expected to observe, of course, you need to invoke what is called quantum order by this order, by which I mean that you need to actually take into account quantum fluctuations. That is to say, classically, you have lots and lots of degenerate classical states, ground states, but when you take into account quantum tunneling and so on, you have that actual degeneracy and picks out of a huge number of kinetic states only a few which actually turns the So it turns out actually that you don't even need to invoke quantum effects. Even the classical level, you can have essentially a thermal analog of that, essentially thermal effects, thermal fluctuations can actually stabilize one state or some number of states over all other states. So it's essentially lacking fluctuations, but in this case, given by temperature. And once you sort of establish that we have, or we have to understand that how we might have orbital ordering, you can ask yourself, can you actually drive the critical temperature, ordering temperature, down to zero by doping and pressure and all the usual things that you can think about, but now apply <coughs> to orbital order and drive it down to zero and maybe have a quantum critical point of a new kind and that's basically what you can actually show, at least by solving simple models, that does occur. So you can actually do have an orbital quantum-driven orbital, orbital -driven quantum critical point beyond which you just have essentially orbital liquid. And you also have glasses. And last but not least, there's also here an effect which might be interesting to those of you who have been quantum hall and have been Torah and so on. So, in many cases, we would like to see how we actually have reduction of dimensionality by actually just looking at geometry, how it changes, as we look at different ratios and so on. And in this case, it turns out symmetry alone that you have in these and actually also many other systems essentially dictates that you have measure reduction. And I'll explain how. And then that, that actually reduction can be either exact, which is actually quite rare, or approximate. But actually it's quite common, especially on those systems. So this is essentially what I'm the fun of this talk. So first I'll basically review all the stuff. So this is essentially where all the orders that I'm talking about in general. Then I'll tell you about how we describe <coughs> them by simple chemicals that essentially capture the lowest order interactions. Now I'm going to the new stuff. I'll talk about order by this order driven by thermal effects, how they essentially can stabilize order by fluctuations, that essentially allow you to have more fluctuations about one state vis-a-vis -vis another. Now show you actually how you can have five chemical points in exactly some of the systems, the two plus one, three plus one dimensions. And then I'll talk, tell you about the relation between symmetries, catalogical order, which here is here very naturally, but also extends to many other systems as well. 
basic ideas of symmetries alone mandate to the left order and the measure of action. Okay, so let me review old stuff. So there's no periodic table in this room, but I guess it, what, the, the, what we're, I mean, what essentially is you have an atomic system and you which have ions, and you look at essentially the highest occupied electrons, highest occupied levels, and traditional levels, what we usually think about are 3D systems. Free means atomic number n is equal to three. D means kind of vector L is equal to two. So we have essentially five states, five orbital states. That's sit there multiplied, of course, by the Earth's vector two to the spin. And in the vacuum, of course, these five things are generate. They have exactly the same energy. But if you put an ion in a crystal, because of the globin effects of the surrounding ions, the five pole density is lifted, and essentially what you have, let's say the cubic crystal, you have essentially a triplet of lowering of lower line energies, which are called P2G, essentially of this form. And then you have essentially two states which are high energy, which are called the EG orbitals, and the form of stuff. And you can sort of see just visually why these states might have a higher energy than these states. So imagine, for instance, if you have another ion sitting to, to the right, and above, and so on, and you want to minimize the coulombic effects that you have with electronic repulsion. So it's obvious, for instance, if you have electronic clouds, so to speak, pointing sideways, then the overlap that you'll have between different wave functions, you do electrons sitting on different ions, is going to be minimized, and therefore electronic repulsion will be minimized, the energy will be lower. And here, it's optical. Here, essentially, you're going to have an electronic cloud coming straight up towards its neighbor, one this distance above or below. And the economic effect is going to be maximized. So this is why these states have a higher energy than these states. And it can, so usually, of course, you can have you can occupy one or more of these orbitals, but what I'm going to talk about today is essentially the situation which is actually very, very common, in which you occupy only one of these two states, or only one of these two states. And what happens, mentally, is that these orders, that these orbitals are actually ordered. You see, as you march along in your crystal from one ion to the next, you're going to find that essentially on one ion, it's going to be a wave function of this type, on its neighbor, it's going to be a wave function of that type, and so on. So you have very, can have very, very rich intricate orders in which you're, what you're looking at are not spins and that and sort of more usual stuff, but actually the trying wave functions themselves, they form the order pattern as you go from one side to the next. Here's another picture of that, because <coughs> essentially we have these five states. So these are essentially called, these EG doubles are called these are these two states, which is squared minus r squared, x squared minus y squared, by which I mean essentially the wave function is equal to some riddle function of r multiplied by a function that depends on the angle. This angle depends essentially here, goes in three cosine squared minus one, so essentially in the form of z squared minus r squared. And so you can put all these angle dependencies in terms of, of course, of spherical harmonics. So this is what we have here. And here, essentially, we're dealing, of course, with element L is equal to 2. So we're just considering spherical harmonics that have L is equal to 2. Now, these five more general states, as I just mentioned a few moments ago, are split in this triplet, in this doublet. <coughs> what, the, what I'm focusing on today are situations in which this degeneracy is firmly lifted by other effects. As a result, as you go from one ion to the next, you get, have some pattern of ordering here and so we can have parallel order here, and so on. So the number cartoon, so essentially, so these are wave functions, and different ions, of course, you can have them occupy in different ways. And so if you have a situation which you occupy only one of these two levels, then it can be that you actually choose a particular pattern as you go from one ion to the next. So here, essentially, is a cartoon of that. This is a colossal of resistance. With this one, you know, of the oxide. And here I show both the spin orientations and the orbitals themselves. So the spins, these black arrows, are ordered in a very, very simple pattern. 
So as you go on the c-axis, you have to essentially multiply by a factor of minus one. And in, within the AP planes, I just multiply. So it's a simple uniform order. The planes here, and stagnant as you watch it on the c-axis. But you see here, there's another thing that actually is shown, which are all those themselves. And here, for instance, you can see that this regard of the products is a form of three x squared minus r squared, whereas this, for instance, is a form of three y squared minus r squared. So, and as you march along this plane, depending on if you're even or odd, sublattice, so wave function of the other, or this type, or of that type. So this is if you want to overall solve it, you have a very, very nice array of all those themselves forming a very simple pattern. And of course, you can have more richer patterns. You can have stripes and zigzags and all sorts of interesting things that you have observed experimentally. Now, we want to understand this thing in terms of simple theory. And because we're accustomed to dealing with spins, we want to map this on formally onto a spin system and use all the arsenals at our disposal that we know about spins to analyze the system. So you have a simple way of doing that. So essentially, if you focus on these two states that I had earlier that form this EG doublet, so remember, I have these two states. This is EG, and they have, so they have three states. And now essentially I can just formally declare that I call this thing a spin up and this thing a spin down for a spin of half point. So I just declare this thing as call this thing spin up, I just call this thing to a spin down, and I now map this on to a spin system. Of course, just formally, I have nothing prevents me from doing that. These two states are parallel to each other, and I work in a subspace. So if I have, if I occupy any state that lies in this EG manifold, it is some even combination of these two rules. I can write it down with some complex number alpha times this, and some complex beta times this. I can formally write this down as some spinner whose amplitudes correspond to the amplitudes that I have multiplying this state and that state. And similarly, of course, I can do the same thing also here. I can think about a spin one system. And this is basically what is written down here. So basically, I can just declare this thing to be spin up, so this spin up. I can declare this thing to be spin down. And now if I tell you that I have to declare ordered array or any configuration orbitals, I can formally map this on and tell you it corresponds to this spin state and, of course, vice versa. Now, in reality, of course, these prefactories that you have here multiplying these two states can be arbitrary complex numbers, only you have to worry about arbitrary normalized. So alpha absolute by square squared is beta absolute by square equal to one. In many situations, it turns out, quite naturally, that these numbers that multiply these two states are actually just real numbers, in which case you basically, instead of having two degrees of freedom theta and phi which parameterize a spin on a block sphere, you essentially only have one angle, and you can parameterize this on the disk and basically, half of the angle corresponds to, because the half the angle corresponds to what you have here, and same with what you have here. So basically, as you, as you probably recall, of course, this you can write down as cos of half the angle and sine of half the angle. If I kind of try to sphere, put this spin on the block sphere, multiply with arbitrary for block phase, and if I set this as a move phase to zero, then basically I can, using an angle of theta, I can parameterize what these numbers, alpha and beta are, and what the amplitude that I have that begins to spin up and to spin down state. And a single angle alpha means, the beta, uh, theta means, I can think about a new disk. On this new disk, I measure some angle theta, and basically the cos of half the angle, the half the angle correspond to the, the different states. So that's another way if I choose this state to be, let's say, the state, the state up, and this state is actually this geometric, the metric across from it is going to be the state down. This corresponds to the angle, let's say, phase equal to zero, so the angle of phase equal to high, and it's going to correspond to the spin down. 
But now we can have any possible states on the pseudo disk, which is going to correspond to some arbitrary combination, depending, of course, on what theta is, all of these two states. And in a similar fashion, I can think about what happens in the free states, and I can write this down also to do this. It's been one. Now you can sort of see that there's actually a very, very nice symmetry property that you can actually use in this problem, which does not appear when you think about usual spins. And it's essentially a consequence of point group symmetry that you have in crystal. So for instance, if this state corresponds, one of these states corresponds to the same two state, which is the form of Px squared minus r, r squared, then by symmetry, essentially, these two states here will correspond to 3y squared minus r squared and 3z squared minus r squared. Essentially, as you go around the single disk, you essentially permute x to y to z three times. So you do it once, you go from here to here. Once again, you go from here to here. You do it left last time, you go from here to here. And of course, you do that three times, of course, takes you back to where you started from. And as a result, if you want to write down any states which are essentially linked by such an operation of permutation of x to y to z, psychically, what you basically do is draw three lines which are separated by the, an angle, a uniform angle of 120 degrees on a single disk. And so essentially, this is what is the to result. Essentially, if I have such, some such symmetry-related states, and of course, it's a right as natural because of course, there's nothing special about the x or y or the z-axis. We all took to one another. So this separates naturally. So we're going essentially by separation of 120 degrees. And similarly, I can do the same thing, of course, for x squared minus y squared, and y squared minus z squared, and so on. And so now I can actually think about uh, systems that represent that. So now, of course, the key point that I use, so I'm going to basically use this trivial map, this formal map, which you might say is just arbitrary and so on. It would be absolutely right. But I use it because if you're sort of accustomed to thinking about spins, and I'm going to write in effective interactions in terms of pseudo spins. But one thing to bear in mind is, even though I'm using these mathematical, simple mathematical tricks, just rewriting it again in terms of spins, one thing in terms of physics that's actually crucial in this regard is that unlike spins that sort of live in their own Hilbert space, the orbitals, of course, represent wave, represent wave functions in real space. So that actually suggests that you have a coupling that we're speaking of what happens in the real space and this internal space that representing what the orbitals do. So essentially, I can think about this two spins that lie somewhere this blue disk and so on, but this is not in terms of degree of freedom because it essentially, depending on what, I, what state I actually occupy, in real space, what's the orbital I actually occupy, I'm going to have different orbital overlaps of one ion with its next nearest neighbor, different sides, as an interaction that's going to depend on what state I actually occupy. So the interaction is not going to be formed S dot S, but going to be more complicated. And that's the origin of essentially the frustration that you have, literally, in these systems. So here again is uh, two of these systems and so on. And now you can do the various calculations that people have done over the years. So one thing you can actually do is to do the usual spin exchange calculation, but now take into account the fact that the overlap integrals depend, of course, on what orbital states you occupy. And as a result, you no longer have just a simple SLS term between those neighbors, R and R prime. But that's going to be multiplied by something that depends on what orbital states you actually occupy. And this is what it really looks like. And these pi represent pseudo spins along different components. So pi r corresponding to a, b, c, or x, y, z correspond, let's say, to what you have in these three states, the projected projection along these three states, EG materials, or projections along these three directions. So essentially here you just get a disk, you partition it uniformly by an angle of 120 degrees, as you can see here. And you have essentially a sphere and along the three partition directions, which of course makes sense because of the temperature. 
And this Hamilton was derived a long time ago, so it was derived by Daniel Chomsky and his first student, Kugel, many years ago. I should say that this Hamilton actually appears again and again in different contexts even. So people would do, for instance, a couple of houses when they look at the particular interactions, low energies, they find exactly or very, very similar looking Hamiltonians. They appear also when people do that vision of other arenas. It's a quite natural interaction to have. Another effect which is actually very, very important, it was related to the young pillar distortions, essentially involves no spin once, no real spin whatsoever, which is all of themselves. And the key observation here is that if I have, for instance, a wave function which is oriented along the z axis, as it would be this thing here, this thing with z squared minus r squared, I would not like to actually have as its neighbors up and down the same state because that would correspond again to a large, larger Coulomb penalty. But I would like, for instance, if I have this state, to have it as nearest neighbor along the z-axis, a state which is a form of x squared minus y squared, which is sort of planar, in which case it's essentially minimize or block and that we have between this and this planar state. So interactions, essentially elastic interactions, you essentially capture the strain that is induced by the oils themselves, or the unpillar effects that we have here, and you can write them down. And so in terms of this partition that you have, for instance, on a sphere disk, and so on, then you have a doublet or a long sphere, and then you have a striplet. And then basically you have this form in the end. So, I, so this looks innocuous, it looks similar to many things we've seen in the past, but actually that's deceptive because this has an extremely complicated. The solutions are extremely complicated. So what's written down here? So essentially you see, at first glance, if I wouldn't, if I would just have pi dot pi that would correspond to usual exchange of directions. It's the usual spin model, nothing profound about it. But now you see that's actually not so simple because I have here two indices. I have an index R, which is the coordinate in the space. I have an index alpha, which plays two roles here. It plays a role of, of what I have here, x, y, and z, but also plays a role of the directions I have along the different cubic directions in real space. To so say, if I actually march along from one last site to its neighbor along the x direction of the crystal, I have pi x pi x, or s x s x, if you want to think about spin. If I march along, along the y axis, it's s y s y, or pi y pi y in this case. And similarly, of course, the z axis. So these are interactions that will be familiar to us, s dot s x s x and so on. But they're not uniform. So it's only on the x direction I have pi x pi x, or on the y direction I have pi y pi y. And similarly, pi z pi z would appear only on z direction. And the origin for that is again just this. So imagine, for instance, that we go back to where I started from. And this represents initially my discussion v z squared minus r squared. So obviously, the state that does not refer to this, this correspondence that we've seen spin up. This corresponds to the spin up. This is not good. I mean, this costs more energy than having essentially a state which is a form of x minus y squared, which we put too much value. That's pretty bad, too much value corresponds to this. This thing, so this thing down. So I prefer to have situations like this. So I have this on top, this below it, and so on in a static fashion, and not a uniform term like this. In other words, I have effectively antiprovetic interactions which link these pseudo spins with some orbitals. Right? So essentially, I have some j, 2j, separates this interaction vis a vis this interaction. And that's basically what's written here. So if I take into account all the nearest neighbors, that's precisely the string that ha as I have here, and you read here, is precisely what's captured by this. J and uh, J. And similarly, there's nothing special about the x axis vis a vis y axis vis a vis z axis. So this is exciting to join this or the z axis. I can also do it for the x axis and the y axis. And I would have exactly the same form of symmetry. 
And that's why we had to sum this to all three directions in a consistent way. So Lambisiac is a have essentially pi z times pi z, which would be essentially 1 times 1, essentially here, so to speak, times j. And if I had this, it would be essentially 1 times minus 1 times j along the z-axis. But now if I do the same thing along the x-axis, and I would take an application along, along the state 3x minus r squared and y squared minus z squared, and then this and so on. So this system is very, very hard to solve in two or three dimensions. And so what you can actually do is look at its classical approximation, by which I mean that you look at the presentation, not of the spin one half, but in some arbitrary spin s, and take that spin s to be infinite, so you essentially get classical. And when you do that, is what you actually end up for each of the materials, the partition is in this kind of formally, is this so-called 100 degree Hamiltonian, kind of which essentially corresponds to the following thing. So essentially you have some spin, which points anywhere on the single disk, and we get projection along the A, B, and C directions, which correspond to essentially these three directions. Along the X direction, you have an intersection form S, X times S, X, S dot A times S dot A, along the X, X direction in your space. In a similar form, the cubic direction B. So you now we have S dot, so let me just make this clear. So I'm doing an intersection calling this A. Direction A. I'm calling this direction B. I'm calling this direction C. And now if I'm looking at two nearest neighbors that belong to the x axis, the directions would form S dot A, S dot A. This is R, this is R, this is EX. And by symmetry, I have a similar form as for the y direction. Wait. Uh, could you back a bit? The what happened to this phase degree of freedom? Yeah, so, it, so you're absolutely right. So, so usually it's not important. People usually ignore it. But it can be important. It does arise naturally in some cases. But I'm ignoring it here. What does it mean that you ignore it? I essentially said to be zero. So, so it most because it's it is very pertinent, it actually does turn out to be zero. But you're absolutely right, it can be important. So of course, if you want to have currents, and so on, it's crucial, of course, to have that. And it does arise naturally in some cases, but in most cases, it doesn't. Do you mean it, it, it is usually zero because otherwise there is an energy penalty? No. There's no, there's no you know, reason for it to be zero. It's just that usually, it happens to be zero in the of the system. So we solve it, try to not be totally important. But there have been cases where people particular systems, in which case it can be important. But usually it's ignored. So it's no, there's no reason for it to be ignored, but usually it's ignored, just because usually it turns out to be important. That's an excellent question. You're not saying that there is no dependence on Pi? Yeah, so what I'm saying is that usually uh, I can take into account the space Pi, and if you take into account this overall phase that I have here, which is not important for a single spin, but it is important to have many of these spins lined up. Well, that's what I have left to go. Okay. But it turns out that these phases are not important. So if I look at what natural phase I get myself into a system, I will get it to be real and not complex. Yeah, I think the question was uh, just let's write down something which is exact. So given the model of all the interactions, how the are occupied. And then decide whether it's important or not. Right. So you are skipping the step. You're just saying, well, we're exactly. not going to write anything, or you can write something. Right. So it's not being, so, so this actually was done by many people before. It doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. You are presenting uh, <laughs> this exactly. So it turns out that, so you have to What do you mean by not important? So when people solve these systems, it turns out that the, the lowest energy states correspond usually to those in which these three factors here are real. So does that have to do with absence of currents? Exactly. So, so if you so, so you don't think current so the current will not arise if you are here. If the natural current of psi star that psi is going to be zero, so the current will only arise if you have that these things are complex. 
Okay. So I'm missing it because you're writing the email joint. I'm not talking what will happen as the ground state, what will be an excited state or something else. At the Hamiltonian level, are you throwing something out? Or even if you put it in, it's still zero. No. Or something is thrown out. I just don't know. Yeah, so the dependence is thrown out. But it turns out, it's very, it doesn't really matter that much. Because in most cases... What do you mean by much? Because the result of you... So you can actually, of course, write this whole thing with the dependence. No. You have, have to write it down, that's for sure. Have to write but then the question is, when you start writing the matrix elements for the form yes. interaction between the orbitals, right. and whether this shows up in the Hamiltonian or it doesn't. Right, why did it get more receptive? So it turns out that they're not important to the receptive. I don't understand why it's not important, because you don't give me the parameters. You have full interaction between the orbitals. What is the small parameter of being not important? No, it just means solve it. So the interaction of the formula I'm writing down here. Of course, you can write them down if you want the full thing, with including both theta and phi, and, and solve it. And to compare it to see what happens when you have it in your mind with parameter. It turns out there's no difference usually. So I'm just making this up. Now is the state statement with zero, or it's not important by 5%? It doesn't have to be zero. It doesn't have to be zero. In most, in almost all cases, it's going to be zero. There's an exceptional case where it's not zero. But those are usually exceptional. So the can you, so I, 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 by, can you summarize it by saying that the, that the typical states you observe are without currents, and thus you are going to model that with a system where you, from the beginning, exclude yeah. currents by cutting out the bases. Yeah. But it's both. a statement about the ground state, not about the Hamiltonian. Yeah. Yeah. About the, uh, the state, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The Hamiltonian yeah. is a Hamiltonian. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's okay. the point. But yeah. if, if, you, if you have something that properly describes the ground state, then, you know, he makes that assumption and then see what you get. But it's yeah. true, of course, you cannot draw the conclusion about the exciting yeah. state. Yeah. Then the ground state. Yeah. So, so to date, actually, there have been very, very few works that have this. And, and this happens without small parameters. It just happens numerically that for whatever reason, differences exactly. are so small that you don't Numerically, that's kind of easy. And the same thing will also happen if I now do this for three components, and now I have essentially this TV systems that have fewer rows, so they correspond to the x, y directions on the sphere, in which I just have this s, x, s, x, though, on x direction s, y, s, y, plus s, y, s, y. Now you want to sort of solve this system. It turns out even when you put the phase to zero, this has no phase to zero, this system is very, very hard to solve. And so, first of all, I should note something about symmetry, of course. So we're all accustomed to the century if I have an XY system, hydrobook system, I always have century or textual symmetries. In this system right here, of course, that's broken because this system right here is not invariant under arbitrary rotations. This one is very, very special. It, just, it, is, well, it respects point of symmetry to have a system. But nothing really beyond that. On the other hand, if you look at what happened in the ground detector itself, on the classical level, then you can sort of see that basically any uniform state, any by arbitrary angle, is a ground state. Even though rotations are not symmetry in the system, they emerge at low energies in the symmetry. So they emerge in symmetries that you might be fancy. And so for instance, one way to sort of see that's generally basically divided down in this form, and you can sort of see that basically any uniform state, or staggered state of being the sum of J happens to be, will be a ground state. So this emerges only about the sector itself, and you can see one And that's why people actually for many years thought that it's actually hopeless to get an oil state in classical models, and you have to take into account the fluctuations. Because you have a C1 symmetry, it actually led ultimately to divergences and disturbed calculations. It turns out actually this is not the whole story. It actually it's even worse because this is actually augmented by four other symmetries, which are not the usual kind, which are actually related to measure reduction that happened by a later on, which are the following. So I guess all of you played Rubik's Cubes a long time ago, or maybe not. But. And so in Rubik's Cube, of course, you can actually take a cube and you can rotate 
arbitrary planes, by arbitrary angles, I mean, by the angles and so on. We do a similar thing here and preserve the ground states. So when, when does? So suppose you start this uniform state here. This is a ground state. These, these arrows correspond to these arrows on this little disk. Any arrow in this disk corresponds to overall state. And so the uniform overall state in space that corresponds to the ground state. And now suppose if I go and I march along from this plane to its neighbor along the x direction, I make a reflection about this a direction, about this a direction. This I claim does not change energies at all, and you can see that immediately. So, for instance, inside each plane, this plane and its interior plane, the one inside the one x-axis, nothing changes. The direction along the previous directions do not change. What you have to worry about, of course, is what I have when I go between this, this ion here and the electron that belongs to this ion here, where the interaction is just a form of pi x, pi x changes. But that, you see, does not change because if I have an arbitrary pseudospin here, I make a reflection about the x as I'm looking at here, and by fiat, pi dot a is the same both of this vector and this one. And so the interaction I have along this bond is the same exact as I had along this bond. It doesn't change. So I can, die, so I can make this re reflection about the direction as I go from this plane to this plane, one behind it, along the x-axis. Do a similar thing, of course, along the y directions. And this is only for a cube that has eight spins, a two spin. Like now, suppose I have a very, very big system of size L by L by L, this big cube. As you march along along each direction, so you have now each plane is of size L by L, each individual plane can actually make a reflection about some direction. So as a result, I now have lots and lots of general ground states which scale exponentially the size of the system. Not with L cubed, but essentially with L itself. So essentially if I have a system of size L by L by L, not just this two by two by two cubed, then the generacy that actually spawns by having these symmetries is the normal factor of 2 to the power 3 L multiplying this overall of one symmetry. Because as you can see, as I march along this x-axis, I can make this reflection or not, which gives me a factor of 2 for each individual direction on the x-axis. Do the same similar thing on the y-axis, similar thing on the z-axis. So overall, I have 2 to the power of Lx and 2 to the power of Ly, Ly the size of the y-axis. To the power of LC, so overall it goes at two part of this cellular <coughs> system. <coughs> and that makes life really very complicated. So now you have a continuous symmetry augmented by this reflection symmetry for each individual plane. And so the situation is really hopeless. And, in, and however, you can actually do more rigorous calculation, which is what we did for the infant chain, not just the ring. And I won't take you through the details of that, I'll just give you a flavor for what this physics is. <coughs> Essentially, it's something that goes by the name of order of uh, disorder, which I alluded to before. And the cartoon is from a plane, suppose you have some parameter, so I said that's the energy. You have some parameter that's called lambda. It's longer axis. And let's say I have two states, states one and state two. And you can see that by this drawing, as it's intended at least, the energy here and energy here, this value of lambda, this value of lambda, are the same. On the other hand, here I have many, many more energy fluctuations than I did here. So even though the energies are the same, once I take into account entropic fluctuations, this state is going to be more favorable than this one. Because there are many, many energy states in the vicinity of this state as compared to this state. So this is essentially a mechanism which is called order by disorder. It's, it appears in different guises. It appears essentially by just fluctuations, like what we did here. It appears essentially by quantum fluctuations. It appears in trophy unfolding. So this hollow that we all just talked about, that we talked about, it's essentially also a manifestation of this. It appears in many, many different situations. And essentially, this hollow fluctuations. So the Casimir effect, in this case, is by temperature. And if you do that, you actually can prove that it actually does order. <coughs> and, and indeed, actually, order is a uniform order for this 120 model, or staggered or, or essentially the magnetic order that you have in the compass model, which originally you have in the compass order parameter. 
but you have older, which is essentially triggered by critical operations. So once you have that, you can actually go in beyond and ask yourself, can you try the group temperature down to zero by doing something, like doping it or applying pressure or so on. Then you can actually have, can have essentially a prime critical point, beyond which essentially having a little liquid. And the answer is yes. You could, I mean, that, of course, the answer is okay, why not? Right? I mean, you can do this for a child and spin and so on for those many, many years. So why not for overdose? And you can indeed write down models you can actually solve exactly and in two different dimensions, and which this does happen. So here, which of course this doesn't mean it happens sort of naturally, but it's possible as a matter of principle. And so here, so here essentially is exactly some of the system that you can look at. So here essentially this compass model now written down in two dimensions here. These are the Sakali matrices, is the original quantum model itself. So I have C max and X and the X directions and Y the Y directions is U is equal to X. The Y here. And so now essentially what I do is I dope it, I dilute it. So essentially the uniform, you can have just a school ass itself, it has a finite T C. Now essentially I pluck things out, I dilute it, essentially move all those out. And I do it in this particular fashion. Of course, I do it, there's nothing special about this fashion. Apart from that, I can actually solve it exactly. And you can see essentially now that I do this in this fashion, the doping that I have here is one quarter. So essentially, from one quarter of the side essentially are removed here. So one quarter of the signal is essentially right down the way. And the topology that I have essentially is when I have when I've done with this, is in this brick wall lounge. So essentially like these bricks that I have here. And you can see here essentially I have two types of sites. I have sites which are essentially two-fold coordinated, like these two sites here. Like essentially okay, so. And I have sites which are essentially three-fourth coordinate. So essentially like this site essentially is two-fourth coordinate, it has its neighbors to the left and to the right. I have essentially sites like this essentially have three, three neighbors and then three sites. And this model, I think it's all exactly. I, I won't take you through the details now. And the basic idea is that if you look at individual chains, what they actually experience are transverse fields from spins on the sides, so to speak. And so it maps exactly onto the transverse Isaac model, which is prime critical when it's uniform, so when you apply to field H is equal to exchange constant that you have. And so basically what you have is that are a bunch of decoupled chains along Ising chains, quantum Ising chains along the y direction, each of which is essentially quantum critical when it, it's a uniform system. They can actually drive it away from quantum criticality by straining it, essentially, and make one of the exchange constants larger than the other. They can do the same thing also in three dimensions and so on. And so basically, what happens is you, you, you can generate systems that essentially have quite a critical point this way. So this is, of course, one of the simplest types because it's, it's all exactly, but you can do this in a more complicated fashion. So now I should actually not have much time. So maybe I'll just tell you in brief about symmetries and topological orders. So this is essentially a route to get the measure reduction by the use of symmetries alone. So what do I mean by symmetries? So by symmetries, in this case, I mean not a particular symmetry that corresponds to U1 or Z2 and so on, but I mean essentially how many sites it actually depends on in real space or random space. So here's an example of that. Suppose I start off the uniform, the usual XY model, and of course this XY model is invariant, as, as you all know, as you all know, under arbitrary rotation by the uniform model. So if I apply the uniform rotation, the energy does not change, and so I go from these arrows to these blue arrows, and nothing changes. And this symmetry is, of course, global because it involves all the spins in my system. And this, of course, emerges very naturally, of course, most of the matter systems that we look at. At the other extreme, I have essentially local symmetries, gauge symmetries, which, of course, we all use. We do some gauge, we choose a gauge, we can choose a gauge which can be for us. Here, essentially, of course, the rising last gauge here. So essentially, you have links. On each link, you have an Ising spin. It's the product, essentially, of the spin that's given these links, multiplied by minus k, so all individual squares. 
this corresponds to the last version of which I wrote the magnetism of Eisenstein into the phases. And this has a local symmetry. So essentially, I can go from uniform states to one which is essentially, I make a, a flip only on these four sides, for instance, here. That does not change energy. That's uniform. That, that's it. Local symmetry. You can involve only in five number of fields. And that's the case of gauge views. But of course, why I'm going between, between essentially global symmetries and local symmetries. So why don't I have essentially objects, symmetries, that don't depend on essentially L squared fields or spins, nor will it depend on L to the power of zero times a finite number of fields, like four here. But they scale, they depend essentially on L, the order of L fields. Why not? Can you have situations in which the symmetries involve just lines or planes in every dimensional system? Or loops that you can think about when you look at unpolished systems and so on. And the answer is that there's no reason that you can't think about it, of course. And in particular, these systems that I just described now, they actually exhibit these symmetries. But not only they, many other systems also have these symmetries. So let me go back to this compass model I just described earlier. It's this one. Same axis like on x direction, same as the z, z direction. Is the same ground state I have here, this, these arrows that correspond to these arrows I have here. And now essentially, this is a computer base, of course. And now I make a reflection of all these spins along a single line. In other words, I multiply, I multiply it by an operator which is of this type, or this type, the horizontal or vertical lines. And this doesn't change one bit of energy, but it involves only L fields, or L spins, not L squared, nor 4, as in usual cases. Now it turns out that this has consequences and actually implies a matter of action. Not in the way that you might think about, not in the sense it actually becomes a system of three different dimensions, but you can bound it by what happens in one dimension. And so you can bound it with what happens in two dimensions if you have two dimensional symmetry and so on. So here's actually a cartoon of, just to give you a flavor of why this happens. So why, for instance, does the Eisen model not Eisen change, not order in one dimension? Because, of course, as we all know, of fluctuations. So you can generate very, very easily a domain wall, which costs energy of 2j. Whereas the entropy itself, if I had just one domain wall to create, goes like logarithm of the number of sites. So the entropy, any, any if I have a signal for an limit, if L goes to infinity, then any, any kind of is non zero, entropy will essentially dictate that it should have this order state. The same thing also happens exactly in systems of given two or three different dimensions or higher that have these symmetries. For instance, here, I again start with this compass model, uniform state, it's a ground state. And now essentially I apply this operation. When you start now not to go around the entire torus, if you want to think about a torus, or the entire cycle, or the entire line, that different kind of conditions, but now I just kind of somewhere. I just start somewhere and I'm not go around all. So the, the, your question is, yes, I said about the AB phase, the, you can see if you go around a closed loop or not, so of course you have to go around a closed loop, but now you just do this integral or sum on the last between two sides. You just start somewhere and you keep going. That involves essentially a generation of a defect between this spin and this spin is going to cost a fine amount of energy. But nothing beyond that. The energy is here before and after applying this equation operator don't change one bit. There's no string penalty. There's no tension that you have here that you want to snap this back, back to zero. It just costs a fine amount of energy of order of J to create this. On the other hand, if I look at the entropy itself, it's going to be the usual thing. It's going to go like log L, logarithm of the size that I have on this axis where I want it to decay. So NGP will dictate that any non-zero temperature, I cannot break the symmetry. The one that essentially implies that I can have reflections for a single line. Because the considerations of entropy versus entropy are going to be the same as I would have had in one dimension. And more generally, you can actually prove a simple theorem which tells you that if you look at arbitrary coordinate, something that involves arbitrary number of fields on some so you have a high dimensional model, a model that resides in say, some different number of dimensions, capital number of dimensions. You're looking at something which involves fields, phi i, that belong to some particular line or plane or 
So manifold that is a subject, it doesn't have a volume that goes like L to the power of D, the rationality of real space, but goes like L to the power of little d. That is to say, let's say one in the case I just showed you earlier, this one. And you can actually bound any Cauchy function that you have in a high dimensional system by one in which you have no dimensional system. Even though the differentials themselves are not going to be different. Of course, this system is going to have a bona fide energy in most cases of what you expect to have for high dimensional systems. You have ion traditions or high traditions, x y traditions, and so on. For a system that literally resides in DM, capital D dimensions, on the other hand, the pressure functions themselves, in many instances, particularly those that involve fields on a particular line, where you have these symmetries, are going to satisfy this equality. And that implies, basically, a generalization of an exorcist theorem. So the exorcist theorem states that you cannot break gauge symmetry in the time temperature. And now you can sort of see that you can actually do the same thing when you have these one-dimensional symmetries that involve lines. So entropy will dictate that you cannot break it, because entropy always wins, and it's impossible to break that symmetry. So when you have continuous symmetry, you cannot break it in three dimensions if you have, if you have to measure continuous symmetry. It's fine that you even if you have a gap in zero temperature. On the other hand, essentially, if you have, if you have a discrete symmetry, like an Ising symmetry, of course, then you can break it to the fine temperature. And you do, in general cases. So what you actually should look at when you look at transitions are quantities that are, of course, invariant under these symmetries when you have to grow them. So, of course, in this case, in gauge field, for instance, only thing you can actually look at are rules and loops. A B fluxes, if you want to think about it, talked about yesterday and so on, and one fluxes and so on. That you have when you go around the particular loop and so on. And you try gauging variant, not to a particular point. The lines and the variant on top of that. Similarly, if you have these symmetries, you have to look at things which are gauging variant, and variant on this quantity, which are usually more complicated than what you have in the usual case. Not a single side operator, but something more complicated with the invariant than the symmetries of So for instance, here is this unit, this bar we talked about earlier. I have a symmetry that I just discussed earlier. I can go from this state to this state. This symmetry cannot be broken, which means the average value of sigma x at any site is zero. The only quantity which can, can, can look at it are quantities like this, which are invariant under these symmetries. And in this case correspond, say, to the type order, in which I prefer to have more in one x direction, using y direction in this case. Let's say. And the same thing also happens for emergent symmetry, so you can also, if you have a system that emerges only for temperatures, the same thing also happens there if you have a gap. And more than actually, in many cases, you have sort of holographic entropy. Essentially, if you look at the entropy, at the entropy itself, it's going to go like, not, it's not going to be finite, but actually it's going to go like logarithm. Like number. So, and basically, so I just, and you know, I don't want to go too long, but basically this tells you, but you can actually test this also experimentally. For instance, suppose you have, if you write down what you expect to be the most important interactions, then, if symmetry dictates that v is actually, the natural order parameters have to be zero, then you can actually just go and measure that until the middle line. You can just look at the study data itself and sort of see if that's zero or not. Or more precisely, you can actually compare that to what you would get, to quantities which, which are sort of invariant under your symmetries and see if there's a big difference or not. So, for instance, if you have, let's say, this Google Homsky model for these so called materials I discussed earlier. And by symmetry, essentially, you cannot have a permutation of symmetry. You cannot order it. And that kind of does it experimentally, which means that basically, the Google Homsky and the is not an entire study, other types coming in. On the other hand, if that has the most important one, then you can, our quantities are invariant under the symmetry that you have in that case. And you can test to see whether actually those quantities are manifest themselves at high temperatures. So, uh, so here's basically sort of where I stop and skip a few things.
So basically, all those systems can be ordered. And the way that right, we should order assumptions about this mechanism I described in the first way. Order our disorder. In this case, the disorder corresponds to chrome fluctuations. So chrome fluctuations say, here is the realization about states that have more room to fluctuate than others. You can have a privilege over a critical point. You have measure reductions by a simple extension of the source theorem. You can also have over pneumatics, and then you can also have a little discuss, I just skipped over the longer effects. Because as you, as you all know, if you have a single spin, then you apply a field, it's going to process. And now if you do this mapping that was described here, and then apply pressure, which prefers it to be in one state because it's in another state, I'm doing the same thing. So essentially, what's going to happen is a function of time, global work is going to fluctuate between in different states. Сейчас надо